Um, and I am delighted that Mike Smith is with us for this first session to talk about building a healthy approach to the life and the work of the pastor. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about him. I've done some promotion about who he is and, and why he's here. Hello, Charles Qualls. And um, Mike is a graduate of Belmont University. I, I should say a very proud alumnus of Belmont University. Uh, and he holds both MDiv and PhD degrees from Southern Seminary in Louisville. Uh, he has uh, been pastor of five different congregations in Tennessee. I got to know him while he was in two of those, and he was my pastor when he was at First Murfreesboro. So I got to know a little bit about him and his heart, and he always became a person of wise counsel uh, for me, which was uh, a main reason for my motivation for bringing him here to the Commonwealth. Mike has also served as an adjunctive professor at Belmont in the religion department and also at Central Seminary. So he's got a lot of experience. He's a published author. Uh, Smith & Hellwist has published, what, three, four books for you? I uh, kind of lost count and gave up yeah. on it. <laughs> the last one being Luke, right? Preaching from Luke. Um, so he brings a wealth of experience, 45 years of pastoral ministry. Um, I think keen insight into the life and the work of, of the pastor. So the three topics that we finally distilled it down to are three areas where I sense are his uh, major contributions. And I believe he has something uh, that he can share with us that will uh, significant, significantly help us in, in our journeys. We're all on the same path. We're all struggling because of COVID-19 and the implications for our congregations. So I welcome you to this time. And I welcome the spirit of the living God into this space. And Mike, we are so glad you're here. Thank you, Terry. Uh, a few things up front about the approach I, I hope we take. And of course, you're free as a group to modify it along the way. That's kind of how things work most of the time. I want us to treat one another as colleagues. I am not a visiting expert. I'm not a consultant. I'm not a coach. Like many of you, I do my share of unofficial coaching, unofficial consulting, but those are not my worlds. So colleague to colleague, peer to peer is how I want to approach this. Uh, in this session, we're going to take up uh, wrestling with how to build a healthy life, really, in the context of the work of a pastor. There's no one answer <laughs> to that dilemma. I'm going to share some of what I think I learned over 45 or 46 years that uh, brought me to retirement more or less sane, more or less healthy at that point. Uh, what I'd like to do is go in presentation mode for a little while, uh, probably a half an hour or so, and I want to hit several topics uh, in that manner. While we're doing that, I want you to be thinking about what you'd like to contribute uh, to the conversation. You may have tricks of the trade that we all need to hear and could benefit from. And I say tricks of the trade in a positive way. Nothing shifty about it. It's just how do you learn to make this a good and healthy life? Uh, you may have questions you want to ask. You uh, will have an opportunity, I think, to add those to the mix. You may want to challenge something and tell me that I'm out of my blooming mind. And that's all right, too. After that many years working with Baptist, I'm fully accustomed to that response. But uh, we, I think we all know the challenge that comes with being a pastor in any congregation uh, with regard to uh, building a healthy life while going about the work. Uh, there are expectations that are loaded onto us. We load expectations onto ourselves quite often, not always knowing where they come from, by the way. Uh, a normal week gets disrupted and all of a sudden you've got four funerals in 10 days. You know the drill. And then a virus comes along and politics come along and you've got the history of your given congregation that you may or may not have known anything about before you got there. And something out of that history rears its head on and on it goes. Then many of us have families of one kind or another and all that comes with that. So I think we know the challenge is, the trick is, uh, what do you do with it? So let me run through a few items. Take note if you want to, again, questions, input, your own contribution. One of the things I, it took me almost two decades to learn 
and I'm slow sometimes, was that I had to stop feeling guilty about periods of overwork. They are inevitable. They come with what we do. Uh, some are seasonal. Advent is nuts, isn't it, for most of us? Lent, even more so. Uh, summer used to be a time when I began in the ministry of a relatively slow period in the life of the church. It's now, what, the most intensive time of the year, most years. Uh, overwork comes. Uh, some are predictable. Some periods of overwork are not predictable, but they are inevitable in our life. Uh, I used to feel guilty about getting caught up in that. After 20 years into this, I laid that guilt aside and said, this is part of the package. Now, there's a second part to that, though. Don't feel guilty about slack time. Because slack time, in my experience, also comes. Have you ever wondered, what am I going to do with this next three hours? You've had a half a day where you thought you would be busy and suddenly you're not. Or for some reason, all the members go away for two weeks and leave you alone. That's slack time. And it happens in the life you and I, I lead. Some slack time is predictable after you've been at a church for a while. Most is not, at least in the long term. Here's the trick to slack time that I learned. Don't go fill it up. And I know it's a temptation. Uh, some of us have a need to feel like we've accounted for every minute and have a task to do in every minute that's self-defeating. So don't fill it up with work or worse, make work. Everybody does that at one time or another for lots of different reasons. Uh, but I think I learned at one point finally was to accept slack time as a gift from God, a little serendipity <laughs> in my life and to begin to use it uh, to rest, to recreate in the ways that worked for me, or maybe to reconnect just with myself or my family or even with God. So two things at the start. Overwork is inevitable in certain periods and sometimes in unexpected ways. We roll with it. We accept that as part of the package. But slack time is also inevitable and the real trick is to learn to use it for our benefit, quite frankly, which in turn benefits our families and often our congregations, quite frankly. So those two things to start with. A little trick of the trade, I think I probably learned from Eugene Peterson, though I can't remember that for sure anymore. Never underestimate the value of using your calendar to protect yourself. Uh, long time ago, I began to use a calendar and I began to uh, use the phrase, I'm already booked. I have an appointment at that time. And it was an honest phrase because I already had something written down at that day, that time in my calendar. It might be go to the bookstore and browse for two hours, but it was written in my calendar. It might be time with Grace, my wife. It might be time with the kids when they were at home, but I had it written in the calendar and so protected in a sense. And the funny thing is I found that worked. The more I did it, the more it worked, not only for me, but for church members. How many of us have ever railed against the idea that we live in congregations that have long been conditioned by business culture? It goes all the way back to my days with Glenn Henson, who just hated that entire thing and still does at age 85. But uh, what I learned is if I use the calendar in the way I've described, most of the people in my church heard it, accepted it, and respected it because they had been conditioned by a business culture to respect another person's schedule, their calendar. It was the easiest way I ever came up with for protecting some personal time and some family time. Does that make some sense to you out there? Maybe all of you are already doing it. Uh, what I found is it helped protect me, the ones I loved, my sense of calling and energy, uh, and in the long run, protected my congregation from a burned out pastor, quite frankly. Those are the simple things that I put on the table this morning. Some of the rest of them are a little more complicated to talk about. I do think that one of the tricks to building a relatively healthy life as a pastor is to know yourself well and structure accordingly. Uh, 
And that's not as easy as some people might want it to be. But the only way I ever found it possible to reach a point of being able to manage my time and my energy in healthier ways was to figure out what kind of person I really am and then to structure my work and my life accordingly. I have friends who are absolute masters at uh, being able to take a fixed day off every week. Uh, you know, Friday, Thursday, whatever it is for them, every week, almost without fail, that's what they do. Uh, they are able to have a firm start and stop time to each day. Uh, these friends are even able to really plan their vacations in detail and take them. And more power to them. I love them and I envy them, but that's not how I'm put together. I don't function well that way. And I'll tell you why. I had to learn that growing up on a functioning uh, beef and dairy farm had conditioned me <laughs> in certain ways. Uh, I don't know if any of you have that kind of background, but I grew up on a functioning beef and dairy farm, and that is a seven-day-a-week operation like most congregations are today. Uh, the cows have to be milked. The cows have to be fed, et cetera, et cetera. You can paint a picture for yourself. Uh, I have a certain temperament. I am a certified breathing, living INTJ, if that means anything to all of you. And it's the real deal with me. It's not just a label. It's how I'm put together. It's how I handle energy or lack of energy. Uh, it's how I approach problems and challenges. So with that background and with the INTJ part of me, having a fixed way of taking a day off, a firm start and stop time each day, never really worked for me. About a decade in to uh, full-time pastoral ministry, I started a, a little different approach. For me, each Sunday afternoon or Monday morning, I would sit down and just on a scrap piece of paper, a uh, yellow pad, whatever, uh, try to scope out the week ahead just try and figure out what that week was likely to look like. You know, I'd look at the uh, plot times that seemed to be most likely to work that week for sermon work and sermon prep and other pastoral duties. I uh, would note any fixed events that were in place for that week. I would take that time on oh, Monday morning to review developing stories in the congregation that might have an impact on my life that week. And you know those kinds of stories, people who are sick or hurting, or there are some problems bubbling out there. Are they going to bubble up this week is what I would ask. And what, how might that affect me? Once I had that kind of scoped out, I would then start to think about, okay, how am I gonna get some exercise in if the week works this way? How am I gonna get really meaningful time in with the family? if the week works the way it looks likely to work and so on. So what I really found was that I did better dealing with one week at a time because that fit who I was and how I came at work and life. I quit trying to change who I was and instead adapted the way I planned to who and what I am. In other words, I kind of custom tailored each week along the way. And it actually worked for me. Uh, in doing that, of course, I left blank spaces where there were blank spaces. I didn't try and fill them in ahead of time, except as I've noted with the calendar, if I knew there was something for family or friends or personal time. Now, how that worked each week was you wound up with gaps each week. They didn't always fall on the same day or at the same time of day. Some might be only an hour long, some might be three hours or four hours long or an entire afternoon at which point I looked at that developing calendar and said, glory, hallelujah, I hope that holds till I get there. And when I had those slack times, I felt no guilt in the end, after a little practice, at using them for whatever I needed to use them for, for me at that time. Now, for me, that sometimes meant if I had a couple of hours free, I'd run to a local fabulous used bookstore. Nashville, Memphis, and Knoxville have fabulous used bookstore, and recreation for me was often just browsing there for an hour or two. It recharged me 
And by the way, I also found some good resources every now and then to bring back. It might be an afternoon of golf. Now, being an introvert, I don't mind playing golf by myself. That's fine. It might be an extra long walk. It might be just getting away from the church building for two hours without any real issue or idea about where I might go for those two hours. You follow what I'm saying? But you custom made or I custom made each week because I knew that's how I was put together and, and I would take it seriously and live it out rather than knock my head against a system I could not work with, namely fixed calendar throughout the week. Another angle that I have worked for a long time, and I think it is important, in order for me to have a healthy life, I found that I had to actively work at building and sustaining friendships with other ministers. Sounds like an easy thing, sounds like a given. It's not for most people, certainly not for me. Uh, how many of you, I wonder, uh, experienced a little post-seminary or post-divinity school shock or post-secular workplace shock when you moved into your very first pastorate and all of a sudden you were alone without people who shared your vocabulary, most of your interest, or even your vision of church or Christ. Uh, it's a real shock to the system, I think, for most of us. Uh, out of that, I realized that I was going to have to have some colleagues uh, so I began to work at it, and I can tell you a few things about that. One, I did find some friendships over the years uh, within the congregation. I don't want to downplay friendships within congregations. To this day, I have best friends in Memphis and Murfreesboro and here in Knoxville. That being said, I also found there were some limits on what I was willing to talk about with those friends or could talk about with those friends. So I needed minister friends with whom to have a relationship. Now, how do you go about that? You'll have to fashion your own way, but here are some things I think I learned. I had to decide that it was actually worth the time and risk to build such friendships. They seldom happen automatically. Uh, there is risk involved. You will be rejected on occasion. You will be betrayed on occasion, in my experience. Uh, and it takes time. It's a real time investment to build meaningful friendships. Time is something we often feel we don't have. Uh, some of the most harassed people I know with reference to time are ministers. They feel overwhelmed. So to build friendships, you have to come make peace with the idea that it's going to take a chunk of my time to do this and then decide to follow up. I think another thing when it comes to building friendships with fellow ministers is I learned I had to lay aside a bit of fear of being perceived as needy or being perceived as uh, someone who was something less than self-sufficient. Uh, ministers, in my experience as a group, are competitors sometimes, or at least they can't help but feel that way when they're in a group. And no one wants to be the one who needs support from everybody else. If you're going to build friendships, you have to get over the fear of being perceived as needy or as less than self-sufficient. Now, there's not any one approach to building friendships, but here are some of the tactics that have worked for me. I'm going to talk about two of them today. Uh, one is a long-term uh, slowly built friendship with two ministers. Uh, I can't handle large groups, but two ministers. We happen to have been in close geographical proximity fairly early in our ministries. Uh, one of them has since uh, gone from the Baptist fold and is now a Methodist minister in North Carolina. Uh, the other went to a different variety of Baptist life and went on to a a uh, career both as pastor and as an academic dean at a small seminary. Uh, we were nowhere near each other after those early years. But we made a commitment as we began to part ways geographically to stay in touch. And this was back in the days when about the only way to do that was by phone or on uh, uh, paper. 
the three of us sat down and said, uh, we've all read uh, diaries, other type items from people who lived in the uh, 1800s, early 20th century. And one of the common features running through those diaries is these people wrote real letters to one another. Uh, talking about family and how they were feeling and politics and their work and all everything that was real to them. So we made a commitment. And to this day, we still write one another. Now we've shifted to email, both because our handwriting is awful, postage, and email is much easier. But we still write letters, not emails. Do you understand what I'm saying there? The email culture is keep it short and sweet. We talk when we write our letters to each other about once a month at the very least. Uh, we go through everything from family to work to health to all the stuff that makes up a genuine human relationship. And this year of politics, we're having a really good time with these letters sometimes. We've done this now for over 30 years. In those letters, we have sometimes at the appropriate time discussed church life challenges, how we deal with it. We've offered emotional support. We've helped one another relocate sometimes when that became necessary. We've walked at least one of us through the loss of an entire family. But it's all because we decided it was worth the time and the discipline to keep doing it in the midst of busy lives. I can't tell you what those two people have meant to sustaining my health uh, as they've sometimes held my feet to the fire <laughs> over the years and often just been there as trusted people I knew who would never betray me and who would do their best to be a friend. Does that make sense to the group? Now, that's a time investment to do that. And there's never an easy time to write that kind of letter. Um, the second model that I have found useful has to do with a long-term ministerial group. Uh, most of us have relationships to some kind of ministerial group, at least in the area in which we're serving, if we're there for very long, and those can be rich, and I recommend them when they work for you. I've had some of those, but what I have found uh, most useful in building my own sense of health and direction in ministry is a long-term ministerial group I have been part of since 1994 or 95. I lose track of the beginning year. Uh, and this is how it works. We made a commitment beginning in the mid nineties to take a two night or three night retreat every year together. It was that hard and that simple and that expensive. <laughs> of course, some of us had expense accounts and some expense accounts were bigger than others, et cetera, et cetera. But the commitment was once a year, and we had a designated time of the year. At first it was late October, it became late August when we got tired of cold weather at our meetings. We would come together and we would spend either two nights or three nights on the road together. Uh, we did it at Lake Junaluska in North Carolina most years. In recent years, we've moved to a motel down in Maggie Valley, but we have been doing it since the mid nineties. The number of people in the group varies. Uh, it has been as low as 11, as high as 14. That depended partially on being able to drive within a day to get together and on moves and retirements, what have you. Uh, when we came together for those three days, we came with an agenda. We spent a lot of time in shop talk. And by shop talk, I mean, we worked on everything from uh, uh, lectionary preaching uh, topical preaching, the year ahead in preaching, we always brought some of what we thought to be our best sermons and shared them with one another. Uh, just the discipline of preaching was part and parcel of that. If you preach in the lectionary long enough, you wind up needing help to keep doing it, for example. So we helped each other. We talked uh, church administration. We talked building programs. We talked, what do you do with politics? <laughs> in your church and what were you doing here? And we would walk through what we actually had done in the past year with one another. Uh, we had no trouble filling up the hours. Let me put it that way. We talked, uh, well, Terry, you'd be interested in uh, Christian formation. 
was a huge topic. How do you help individuals and small groups move along on this road? Um, each year, I would return to my congregation with anywhere from one to three usable, really usable ideas that could be accommodated to the realities of my congregation. Uh, we're still doing it. When this, this was the first year we did not gather and that was because of COVID. So we went online with one another and it wasn't half as satisfying, but it was real. Now we also had fun on these retreats. Uh, half of us play golf, so we always got some golf in. Other people love to mountain bike, others love to hike. Uh, we spent time over meals. We got to know each other so very well that the other thing happened. The barriers came down. And for the most part, this group will share just about anything within the group and with one another. It's happened time and time again over the years. Now, how many of you have environments where you feel free to do that? I can tell you that during the high times and the low times of my own ministry, the commitment of this group to one another and the growing trust within this group got me through. And I can tell you it did the same for others in the group. Uh, we walked through family trauma. We walked through uh, what should have been called forced termination, but more polite terminology was used <laughs> in congregations. Uh, we walked through uh, serious illness alongside one another. Uh, and we walked through those kinds of events in the life of congregational ministry where you want to cuss, but you know it's not allowed. Well, you could <laughs> in this group. And I'm not really making that up. Uh, even today, I can pick the phone up and call one of them if I need to, or they can do the same with me. And we all know we'll get the hearing that we need. Now, I want to come back to one thing. That takes a lot of time. It's not an inordinate amount of time, but it's serious time. Uh, the group has to have longevity. The group has to have investment. You got to go. I have missed two meetings in all those years. Once because of the wedding of the century and once because I was in a hospital with major surgery. The same other people would say the same. So I do think building... A, and sustaining long-term friendships is a real key to having long-term health in the ministry. Um, there's a kind of accountability that comes with that kind of group as well, but it's not something false or artificial or brittle or harmful. It's a sense of accountability that grows out of a long shared experience alongside one another, deepening trust, year after year, genuine love for each other. Uh, we care deeply about each other. Uh, so that's why I talk about building, sustaining friendships. Uh, we need that level of friendship. It seldom happens among ministers, but it can happen. And that's why I've camped on it. Uh, this long. And we can talk more about the ins and outs and mechanics of that, if you wish. Another thing that I was slow to develop because I started out with ideas that did not work for me. I do think uh, our health requires developing a, a rhythm of personal worship. Uh, that rhythm is going to vary from individual to individual. No one size really fits all. And we've all seen models. We've all studied them in seminary or in subsequent years. Uh, and many of you probably already have a, uh, a model up and working. And I'd be anxious to learn about them if you're willing. But what I'm really stressing is it's important to our health to have some way of practicing private worship. Let's face it, Sunday is not Sabbath <laughs> for us. Uh, maybe it is for you. It wasn't for me. Sunday was a day when I was deeply engaged in public worship, meetings, and dealing with individuals. Uh, we have to find our Sabbath and our worship in other places and times, I think. Uh, many of us, I think, develop the habit of private, 
quiet times, scripture reading, etc. And for those uh, for whom that works, uh, I tip my hat to you. I didn't find that it worked very well for me. Uh, personally, I finally came to the conclusion that I did my best and most consistent personal worship while driving or walking. It's just the way it worked. Uh, eventually, it dawned on me that I spent a lot of time in an automobile. Uh, in the three metropolitan areas in which I have pastored in uh, the last couple or three decades of my life to date, uh, there were many hospitals scattered all, all over the region, and my people had the annoying habit of scattering themselves among those hospitals. Uh, that's a lot of drive time. Driving to and from the office in the mornings is drive time. Driving to meetings of other kinds is drive time. So I began to use that instead of listening to sports radio or even NPR, which I would highly recommend, I would have my conversations with God while watching <clears throat> the road at the same time, of course. And over time, I learned that that was a good environment for me. It was predictable. I'm going to get in the car tomorrow, you know, morning, drive to the office. Let's get some use out of that time. Uh, driving home in the afternoon, it was a very different conversation <laughs> with God sometimes. Uh, but it worked for me, and it still does, even in retirement, because I still get out and about. Uh, you can supplement that with scripture uh, that you listen to on the radio or whatever, or from your phone. But uh, what I found was just, it was a good chance to, uh, to pray in my own way, my own time, and to listen for the voice of God. And it became a very important part of keeping me centered as I entered the day and recentering me as I exited from the day on my way home, if that makes sense. Um, to me, it felt natural. It fit like a glove. And one of the things I'd be interested in hearing from the rest of you is what kind of personal worship fits you like a glove? Well, it actually works for you. Other item that I would put on the table today is uh, I want to talk about journaling. And I know that's commonplace. It's, it's huge among moderate Baptists and has been for decades now and should be. Uh, very familiar practice to some of us or many of us. And I highly recommend it if you haven't tried it because it forces us to slow down every now and then. It forces us to think and to feel, might even force us to pray. And the nice thing about having some form of journal is you get to read back through it occasionally. And it's amazing when you read back through a journal written over a period of time, how often you begin to see patterns in your own life, in your ministry. And the more of those patterns you and I can identify and uh, evaluate, the healthier we become. You might begin to see a pattern of how you handle stress appropriately or inappropriately, for example, just throwing that out. But I will say this, for me, normal everyday journaling was not sufficient. I needed a second kind of journal. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, I learned a trick from Abraham Lincoln and from Harry Truman. Both of those presidents during their presidency had a habit of writing letters when they were vexed and putting that letter in a file and never sending it anywhere. I took that idea and I adapted it a bit and I created in addition to uh, the occasional ongoing journal that I would keep, I created what I called a God and me only journal, kind of a sidebar journal. At first, of course, on paper in later years uh, in electronic files. But in these entries, I was just talking with God. Just talking with God. And I would say exactly what was on my mind in language that fit the occasion. I would call names when writing these pieces. I would try to be as brutally honest about how I felt and what I thought and what I wish I could have said. And what I wish I had not said, you know, follow the line right there. You can think of these as uh, kind of uh, similar to some of the Psalms right here, except I never intended them for public use in any shape, form, or fashion. 
Uh, and what I would do there is I would then take that written page and put it in a file or electronically file the entry away. And about a week or two later, I'd take it out and read it again to myself. And then I would destroy it. I would eradicate it. And I'm going to tell you why I did that. There are some things I cannot put down on paper or in an electronic file and be honest while doing so. If in the back of my mind, I think they ever will be read by someone else. If I think in the back of my mind that someone will read this and completely misunderstand it, be hurt by it, be misled by it. Uh, I have to get that shadow over my shoulder eradicated from the process. So these are God in me only files. They are in effect an online uh, file or a, not online, but a computer file or a paper file that serves as a kind of confessional booth for me where I say things I will not say to someone else, but I will say them to God and trust that God can handle what I'm saying. I found that to be a tremendous help to me in staying healthy as a person and as a minister. I got it off my chest and I didn't try and edit it because we all self-edit, don't we? When we're in conversation with other people, especially church members or others. Here, I tried to get the self-editor out the only way I could think to do so. And for me, it worked and continues to work. And I guess the last item I want to put on the table has to do with leadership. Now, we're going to come back to leadership in the next two sessions, I promise you, because leadership is vital to those topics. But uh, the thing I want to talk about in terms of leadership and building a healthy pastoral life is this. Leadership is actually key. The practice of leadership is key to building a healthy uh, pastoral life. We have to choose to lead, and when we do so, it does some good things for us. One, it helps us feel a little bit less helpless and buffeted by the work of ministry. Uh, attempting to lead gives us, most of the time, a sense of meaning in the everyday work that we do. It's not just another hospital visit, another conference call, another individual conversation, another administrative detail to be ironed out. It's not just another budget to build. Uh, there's a larger purpose and you're using it to move in the direction of accomplishing that purchase. Uh, but here's some things I did learn about leadership with reference to building a, a healthy life. It's very important, I think, to lead within the uh, leadership context of a given congregation. Each congregation I served, at least, had a leadership DNA, <laughs> just baked in, <laughs> absolutely baked in. At the surface level, for example, some congregations are pastor-led. They have been for decades. They probably will be for decades. Some are committee-led. Some are deacon-led. Some are council led. And some, you can't decide how they get anywhere when you look at their actual history. But each congregation does have some kind of leadership DNA, some way it has approached making decisions, implementing decisions, following up on decisions, some way it has forged whatever identity it has. And it behooves us if we're going to lead them well, and also just not get unnecessarily uh, hurt in the process to discern what their leadership DNA is and to decide whether we can adapt to it and use it. Uh, I can't tell you how many colleagues have absolutely run aground in the first six months to 12 months of pastoral ministry because they were determined to lead a congregation in a way it didn't know how to be led. I hope that makes sense, and we'll come back to it. Uh, I've been part, I think, of all those <laughs> approaches to leadership at one point or another, and it took me a while to learn, but uh, I began to adapt and to identify how does this congregation actually get it done? Okay, let's see what I can do to work with that system. Now, we might change the system down the pike, but we started there, and it was good for me. It reduced my stress level when I felt like I knew what are the rules of the game in this congregation. Um, 
You've also got to lead within the context of your own temperament, your own skills, your own gifts. I think one of the most difficult things for a fair percentage of ministers to learn is you really can't be someone you're not. You can be who you are, and you can grow and become better at being who you are, and that includes leadership. So I've told you I'm an INTJ, and it's a serious thing with me. I've got, like all of us, history that has uh, formed me in many ways. So I began to learn uh, really in my first post-seminary pastorate and, uh, and then afterwards that there are certain ways I can provide leadership. And uh, here's what ultimately developed. I came to realize that I lead most naturally in the following ways. I tend to lead on a knowledge-based way. I lead from a base of knowledge. I tend to lead by personal example in the congregation, how I respond to things and handle them in public. I tend to lead by being a non-anxious presence in the midst of anxious people. I tend to lead best when I uh, have a physical presence in the midst of the people. I've been accused of haunting the hallways in a church. My church members used to tease me in each of my last three congregations that they couldn't go anywhere with the church without running into me at some place. That was natural to me, and it became a part of the way in which I led. It actually provided uh, opportunity over the years for some of the most meaningful conversations I had uh, in relation to church leadership. Uh, I found that I led most naturally through teaching and that I led most naturally through communications and framing matters for the congregation. which I found to be valuable because somebody's going to frame whatever's in front of the congregation. And I found I had some gift and some skill for that and decided to make it part of my leadership package. Or to put it another way, I became the one in my congregations who knows, the one who frames, the one who is there, the one who is calm, and the one who takes an anxiety-ridden situation and provides at least an avenue for the congregation to move along that moves beyond the, uh, the stress in the congregation into more of an assessment movement progress mode. Now, I did that not because I set out ahead of time and identified those factors as the perfect way to lead. No, it's the way I could lead. And when I, the more I lived into that, the less stress I experienced as a pastor because I was leading in a way that fit me. Now, that didn't mean I was the right leader for every situation. (laughs) The other part of that is the more I knew about how I naturally led, the harder the look I took at each congregation that came to me over the years with a potential call. And one of the questions I asked myself repeatedly was, Am I the right kind of leader for that congregation insofar as I understand that congregation? And I learned finally that it was okay to say, I'm not. I'm not. I also found that leading in ways naturally to me made it possible for me to accomplish more in less time, Uh, which was important because the longer I was in ministry, the more there really was to accomplish. So I throw all that out today just to kind of uh, jumpstart the conversation, a couple of things. Nothing I have talked about eliminates all stress, period. Stress comes with the ministry. It does sometimes give us the chance to choose which stress we will embrace and how we will embrace it. Um, It also helps us, I think, uh, to find energy (laughs) enough for the task. Uh, and finally, I think it, uh, it helped me actually have a life as opposed to just a task. Uh, now, next week, we're going to take up uh, <laughs> pastoring during a time of incivility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the week after that, we're going to talk very specifically about how you might work with ministerial colleagues in your church in ways that are useful both to them and the congregation. But what I'd like to do now, uh, Terry and others, is open this up for conversation, comments, input. 